In the last video, I tried to establish that Rome had adopted a new political form, the empire, fit for a decadent people. Here we have the decline of the Romans or the decadence of the Romans that Montesquieu promised to talk about in the title of the work. The Romans now loved luxury. They would hesitate to risk their lives in war. They would have the state facilitate their pleasures through games and gladiatorial contests and public baths. They still seemed to hold commerce in contempt, and they would depend upon the military to create wealth through plundering, and the military itself would become much more professional in that it was not based on citizen spirit or public honor, but rather personal allegiance and graft. Later, in chapter 15, Montesquieu calls Rome a city, quote, full of timid bourgeois, end quote. A bourgeois man is a technical term, the term for someone who would prefer pleasure to honor and who seeks to avoid risking one's life at all costs. It is a modern word of opprobrium, used to the greatest effect by people like Rousseau and Tolstoy. Karenin and Oblonsky are bourgeois in different degrees in Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, for instance. Rome was now a people that lacked its virtues associated with poverty and honor. It lacked the public spiritedness, and hence the Romans did not mind if they lost their liberty. All power was now centralized in a Caesar and an emperor. Caesar Augustus abetted the corruption of the people by taking the power that they offered him while concealing it under the forms of the Republic. Montesquieu presents in the next chapters a portrait of what the empire or country looks like when both the people and the great, the many and the few, turn to the prince or to the Caesar for their status and for their goods. Chapter 14 concerns mostly the corruption of the great, that is, how the Senate and the formerly noble people of Rome came to subordinate themselves entirely to the emperor's favor. Chapter 15 is, in a way, more depressing still, because it concerns how this central authority and Caesarism corrupted the people before it turns to a slightly more happy topic. It is necessary to give, in broad strokes, a history of the empire, and especially a history of the emperors. Broadly, in my view, there are several turning points in the history of the Roman Empire, the empire itself begins with the reign of Caesar Augustus in 27 BC, and it lasts for over 500 years, and there is just too much contention about when it ends, so I will leave that part unsaid. The first period of the empire begins with Caesar Augustus, and it is a period of consolidation. Caesar Augustus reign, uh, died of natural causes in 14 AD, but nearly every one of the subsequent emperors between him and the next period of Roman history was killed or committed suicide. The greatest monsters of the Roman imperial history, Tiberius, Caligula, Nero, Domitian, are from this period of time, roughly 27 BC to 96 AD. In the next period, Rome enjoyed a series of wonderful emperors, beginning with Nerva, and ending with Marcus Aurelius in, 9, in 96 AD. Until, so this uh, Nerva comes up in 96 AD, Marcus Aurelius ends in 180 AD. Marcus Aurelius' disastrous son, Commodus, put an end to this so-called Antonine dynasty, as it is called, when he, his debased tyrannical rule prompted an assassination in the palace. After that, there was over 50 years of disastrous, short-lived emperors who became emperor only with the help of the military and could maintain their position only so long as they kept the military happy with large donatives and promises of more. Machiavelli himself uh, treats of this period in chapter 19 of The Prince, beginning on page 75 of the Mansfield translation. Putting the military in charge, in essence, perhaps counterintuitively, threatened the very military security on which rule rested, and it made the lives of the rulers very precarious. Because if military competence is all your rule is based on, someone can always be found who is more competent. 
If you look at the list of these emperors, many of them reign only for a matter of weeks. Very few of them reign for more than 10 years. It became necessary to reorganize the Roman emperor, Empire, and this was done beginning with Aurelian in 270 AD, Probus in 276 AD, and both those guys were assassinated, and ultimately with the very important figure of Diocletian, who ruled from 284 AD to 305 AD. This is when the illusion that the Caesar was the first citizen or the princeps was finally abandoned, and the dominate, where the emperor was the representative of God on earth, came to be the rule. It is defined by an attempt to bring religious unity to the empire. If Diocletian himself considered himself to be a god, this general approach to ruling culminated in the rise of Constantine the Great, who reigned from 306 to 337, and who did m most of the things necessary to make religion, uh, Christianity the religion of the empire. Now, Montesquieu himself does not seem to recognize this particular division, though he does share the judgments about individual excellent emperors like Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, and Diocletian, and of the bad ones too. I think this different organizing principle means that Montesquieu is writing about something else, and that something is the state of the people as a reflection of these emperors. Chapter 13 is entitled Augustus, who ruled for 44 years. Chapter 14 is entitled Tiberius, who ruled 22 years. Chapter 15 is entitled, quote, The Emperors from Caligula to Antoninus, a period of well over 100 years. Chapter 16 is about the condition of the empire from Antoninus to Probus, also a period of well over 100 years. Then chapter 17 is entitled Change in the State, it ends. Um, it, uh, it, it begins with the reforms of Diocletian and concludes with the discussion of Constantine and the new religious system. Though it is not altogether clear what the change in state that Montesquieu refers to in the chapter's title is, let us try to figure out what Montesquieu is up to in the rest of this video and the next. Chapter fourteen on Tiberius continues the work on Augustus. It con concerns principally the corruption of the upper class or the Senate under conditions of Caesarism. Tiberius begins his reign in the footsteps of his father, but so suspicious is he of threats to his rule that he ends his rule undermining the Senate's position as a trier of criminal proceedings and concentrating all executive and judicial power into his hands. The political apparatus comes to reflect a love of order enforced by the law of the ruler's character increasingly. Tiberius's rule ends up just like such a despotism, but it gets worse. Chapter 15 concerns the emperors from Caligula to Antoninus, good and bad alike. The corruption of the people is manifest in these particular tyrants. The good leaders of this time continued the work of consolidation, helping Rome expand its empire under people like Tiberius initially and Trajan eventually, and to protect its borders, and these good rulers found a way to further beat down the great and give the great senate little left to do except offer flattery to achieve heights. And these were the good rulers. This led the empire to cutting off its nose to spite its face because only the great and honorable could offer any resistance to the new imperial order when it turned bad. And they were made dependent on the empire, emperors. And bad they often did turn. The bad leaders during this time, or as Montesquieu says, these monsters, used their great power to fulfill all the base desires that they had. And Montesquieu makes clear that the vile rulers reflected a vile people. I guess Rome had a species of representative government after all. Nowhere is this clearer than in what he says in the middle of chapter 15. The people of Rome, who were called plebes, did not hate the worst emperors. After they, the people, had lost their power, and were no longer occupied with war, 
they had become the vilest of all people. They regarded commerce and the arts as things fit for slaves, and the distribution of grain that they received made them neglect the land. They had been accustomed to games and spectacles. When they no longer had tribunes to listen to or magistrates to elect, these useless things, the spectacles and games, became necessities, and idleness increased their taste for them. Thus Caligula, Nero, Commodius, and Caracalla were lamented by the people because of their very madness, for they wildly loved what the people loved and contributed with all their power and even their persons to the people's pleasures. For them, these rulers were prodigal of all riches of the empire, and when these were exhausted, the people, looking on untroubled while the great families were being spoiled, enjoyed the fruits of the tyranny, and their joy was pure, for they found security in their own baseness. The first of these two decrepit rulers ruled in the immediate aftermath of Tiberius. Tiberius had died in 37 AD after ruling for 22 years. Caligula immediately took over and ruled for four years until 41 AD when he was assassinated. Nero ruled from 54 to 68 AD, and he committed suicide after being declared a public enemy by the Senate. The other two monsters that Montesquieu mentions in this area, Commodius and Caracalla, came about after the age of the Antonines. Soon after the time of Nero, it would have been impossible for an emperor to rule against the wishes of the military. One should pay close attention to the treatment of the two different periods in chapter 15, page 139 in the Lowenthal Cornall translation. There Montesquieu compares the relationship between the Senate, the emperor, and the army under Tiberius with a time when the Senate became completely downtrodden after the fall of Nero. Tiberius continued to use the Senate as an instrument of statecraft initially, at least, and the army had to especially fear and respect the Senate's influence. The Senate, after all, was a very venerable institution in Rome. Once the Senate was spoiled, it was impossible for succeeding emperors like Ortho and Fatelius to respect anything. From that point on, the soldiers grew accustomed to big donatives of money and large freedom in determining who the emperor was to be. Let me just underline this point before ending this video. Only a certain kind of people are subject to such a military despotism. Only a corrupt people, that is. Such corrupt people may have excellent rulers still. And it is near the end of chapter 15 that Montesquieu praises Trajan as the most accomplished prince in the annals of history, page 141 in the Lowenthal Cornell edition. But his accomplishment lies in further conquest and in asserting respect and authority among the military for the emperor, not in making the people love freedom or honor it. This kind of corrupt people would find it difficult to maintain an empire.